<clears throat> Not sure when I'm going to have occasion to wear this again now. The Time of the Doctor, the final story of Matt Smith's run as the 11th Doctor. Welcome to Take Two Doctor Who Reviews. Starting with Day of the Doctor, we've now actually started to overrun with episodes I have actually done reviews on before, but since they are a number of years old, my feelings have changed and all those reviews were, you know, my opinion after seeing it for the first time and now I have the benefit of hindsight, knowing what came later, etc, etc, etc. Time of the Doctor! This is a really odd story. And I think ultimately the incongruity and the issues I have with it come down to the fact that it's doing, honestly, probably three or four episodes worth of stuff in one episode. An extra long episode, granted, but still, that doesn't give the leeway that you would need. And as a result, a lot of the bits that are in it feel disconnected and they don't flow easily one into the other and there are things that are payoffs for things that might have had weight if it was paying off something like that had been introduced an episode or two ago but instead it's paying off something that was introduced the same episode or in some cases like 20 minutes ago so you know it doesn't really <laughs> doesn't really carry the same weight. So when I say it's doing three or four episodes worth of stuff, I don't mean necessarily it's crammed three plots worth of stuff in here, but I mean for the events that are being portrayed to land properly, they needed to be spaced out over more time. And I'll actually start uh, as an example of that by pointing out something I really like. Handles. The Cyberman head that the Doctor starts out with, that he's just hanging out with in the TARDIS, that he's trying to have conversations with, and it's not good at it because it has a very robotic vine, but Handel still has a little bit of personality, which I really like. And towards the end, we get basically a goodbye with Handel's. And the Doctor seems choked up about it, and it's a well-done scene, but it doesn't land as well as it should, as well as it would have, if we'd seen the Doctor traveling with this thing for at least one episode before now. Instead, it's just, oh, that thing that was introduced and has honestly been in like maybe four scenes of this entire thing is now dead. Bummer. I kind of liked it. That's about the most that the impact is on me. And given how much I enjoy Handles when he's around, I should feel more when he shuts down. But I don't, because the, the amount of time between when I first met him and when he's gone is too short. And there's a lot of stuff like that. The, with the head of the papal mainframe, similar sort of thing. They, that one, I think maybe works slightly better because sometimes you can get a sense of history between characters thanks to the performance and the dynamic of the actors and, the Eleventh Doctor and Tasha Lem have that a little bit, but still, I feel like what was done with her would have paid off better if we had met her before. The stuff with Clara's family is really weirdly crammed in. Like, first of all, I don't know why it's there at all. Like, we had established a tie to Earth for Clara, and it was Angie and Artie. Now, I'm not stumping for Angie and Artie. I actually don't really like them. But you have already established, you know, earthly connections. And now out of nowhere, you're introducing her family who we've never seen before. And again, you're trying to milk some emotional resonance out of, especially the grandmother. And maybe that would have been there if we'd ever seen them prior to this episode. And also, like, oh man. Some of the stuff... Some of the stuff, it feels crammed in because it needs more space to breathe to land properly. Other stuff feels crammed in because it's like, why is that even there at all? So, like, for instance, 
Clara gets roped in with the doctor because she made up a boyfriend and wants the doctor to come and pretend to be her boyfriend. It's just so, it's just so 90s sitcom. It's so uninventive and unoriginal. It doesn't really feel like it's properly in character for her. At least not as we understand her. And definitely not as we understand her relationship with her family. Because we haven't seen her with her family. That's the kind of thing that might have worked if we knew more about her dynamic with her family. So that her doing that would have made sense based off what we know about the way they interact. But we don't. So it's out of nowhere. And it's a lame joke. So there's stuff like that. Some jokes like... That's kind of fun. Like the wooden Cyberman. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, it's kind of dumb, but like it's kind of stupidly brilliant. So I, I kind of, I actually do kind of like that. But even bringing up the Cybermen brings up the fact that they don't really need to be here because that gag is about their entire function. And that's actually true of a lot of, the extra stuff that's in here. There's a lot of stuff that's here because it feels like it's here out of obligation. First of all, basically anything that ties into Christmas feels very obligatory because nothing inherent about the story really lends itself to Christmas. So it, and that's happened before. That happened with stuff like, say, uh, The Runaway Bride. But that that episode didn't go so far out of its way to cram in a bunch of Christmas stuff. It acknowledged, hey, it's Christmas, and that was, and like had the Santa robots come back, but that was basically it. And I say that as someone who doesn't even really like Runaway Bride, but I'll give it credit in the, on this level. Whereas here, we've got Clara's family for Christmas dinner, which means we get to crack jokes about Christmas crackers and turkeys and things like that. We've got the town called Christmas because, okay, but it's all just stuffed in there because it's the Christmas special and we're obliged to acknowledge Christmas. And the way I, the reason I got on this in the first place is it feels very much the same thing with a lot of the additional villain creatures who are in this. It feels like they're in it because this is the end of an era, because it's the end of the 11th Doctor, it's the end of Matt Smith's tenure. And, but... They don't feel organic to this story. The Weeping Angels have no reason to be here. The Cybermen have no reason to be here. The Sontarans have no reason to be here. Especially they have no reason to be here to be treated like a joke. And I've mentioned this before, like, look, Strax is amazing, but he works as a joke in the context that he exists in. The joke should never be he's just an idiot. And these Sontarans are just idiots. So I won't blame Strax for ruining the Sontarans. I will blame this gag in this episode, though, because it extrapolated the humor of Strax and projected it onto the entirety of the Sontaran race, and we haven't seen them as villains since. So there's all this stuff added in, and to make another comparison to a Davies story, the end, uh, well, it wasn't actually the end of Tenant's run even, but the end of series four, Journey's End, had a lot of stuff crammed in it and had basically every companion that had been on the show up to that point in it. But it found a way to integrate them into a story where it made sense that everyone somehow got wrapped up in it. Whereas the whole idea of the reason all these things are here is because a signal went out and everyone heard it. Well, okay, first of all, you did that already. That was the Pandorica Opens. So you're recycling this for no purpose other than you want an excuse to have other creatures involved. And you got away with it in the Pandorica Opens because it was a more novel concept of all of these things in the same place. And then plus the twist at the end, it turns out they're all working together. So you paid it off in that instance, Moffat, but you're not paying it off here. It's much more contrived here. It reads as cheap. I can see the seams. I can see the strings. I can see the hand of the author. Just pushing things around to do, to allow him to do and have the things he wants that don't have a reason to be there. 
other than he wants them. And I'm not saying authors and writers have no leeway to just do something because they want to, but there is a limit and there's too much of it in this. I gotta check my notes because I did actually write some stuff down, figure out what else I even want to bring up. Uh, the whole naked thing, I, I didn't find that very funny. And I, it's one of those jokes that it drags on. It's the source of humor for like five solid minutes. So it, if it doesn't work for you, it becomes painful very quickly. Those sorts of drawn out jokes are a gamble. And for me, that one didn't work. Um, oh, I didn't realize this before. There's a plug for BBC iPlayer in the middle of this. That's, I, I mean, I, fair play, I guess. It's the, it's their own thing, but that, that struck me as weird. Oh, I don't like that they're right off the bat in this episode hinting that, oh, we found Gallifrey, kind of, or we found a way to communicate with Gallifrey. I don't like that the thing that was set up in the very previous episode is already getting tackled. One of the things I really liked about the idea of Gallifrey is saved, but somewhere where the Doctor can't find it, was I liked the idea of that was going to become a long-term mission for the Doctor to find Gallifrey again. But he's effectively found it the next episode. I mean, he doesn't pull it back into our reality, but any tension of will he find Gallifrey again, oh, look, he found it. <sighs> and, and like, Moffat tries to milk that again later on. And when I get to that again, I'll let you know what I think about it. But just the fact that it was brought up immediately in the next episode, that alone already annoys me. Additionally, they wipe out the whole the Daleks forgot who the Doctor is thing in this one, which I'm more, I mean, here's the thing about that. The amount of time that passed from when that was implemented, because that was implemented at the start of the series, I, I guess it's slightly better, but we'd already had Daleks this series. And I feel like for that idea that the Daleks don't remember who the Doctor is to have any weight, we needed to go at least a full, a full series, you know, into the next series before we ever address that again. Because otherwise you're just wrapping up something that you introduced this same series. And they did. And also it turned out that that entire notion had like no impact on anything at any, you know, between when it started and now. So truly what was the point? Oh, Clara dropping that she fancies the, do fancies the doctor. Since when? Am I the only one who feels like that comes out of absolutely nowhere? Like, I get that she enjoys traveling with him and she likes being around him. I never got a fancies him vibe off her. Maybe it's me and the fact that I don't like romantic subplots anyway that I had an aversion to it, even if it was there, but I didn't see it at all. So that really felt like it came out of nowhere. The whole idea of the silence as a religious order I'm, I'm both like, okay, and also a little bit irritated because a, as an explanation, it's actually fairly functional. Works overall in the idea that the silence themselves, those beings were basically originally created to be something to confess to. And they even account for Madame uh, Kavarian's branches being an offshoot that broke away from the main religion and was doing... Um, their own thing that the rest of the church wasn't cool with. So, like, it covers the bases, but that is all it's doing. That plot point has no bearing on the story actually being told right now. It's only in there to try and paper over cracks from a previous story. And again, just... It, it feels, it's one more thing that feels crammed in because it's not organic to the story that's actually being told, which I haven't really even gotten to talking about yet. Give me a minute, I'll get there. I actually um, do like the 13 regenerations, 13 lives, 12 regenerations limit being covered in here because if, if it wasn't talked about flatly, pedantic fans were gonna be all over it. 
So I like that it got addressed. I actually felt like that got addressed fairly organically. And also, like, as a thing, anyone who is defending the Timeless Child on the basis of, oh, well, they needed to do it so that the Doctor has unlimited regenerations... No, they didn't for two reasons. First of all, it was a, it was a new set of 13 regenerations at minimum. I'll come back to that in a second. New set of regenerations, a minimum of another 13 lives. It took the show 50 years to get through that many in the first place. We didn't need to add additional things. And beyond that, there's a much simpler way you could have accounted for it. Oh, that new regeneration that the Time Lords gave the Doctor... I guess it didn't have that same limit on it. Does it have any limit? We don't know, so that there could still be tension at any given regeneration that maybe it's the last one, but we don't know. We didn't need the Timeless Child to fix that. There was nothing wrong with it. Yes, I'm still bitter about that thing. Okay, so let's actually talk about the story that happens. Now, the story that I'm going to focus on, because like I said, a lot happens. The stuff with Clara's, you know, family happens, and... Stuff with the Daleks happens, and Tasha Lem happens. But where this actually works for me best is during the period where the Doctor is just hanging out in Christmas, dealing, you know, year after year, century after century, just dealing with the threats that are there, watching the sun come up for two minutes, and enjoying the time as best he can, bonding with the people who live there, making friends, fixing toys. There is a fairy tale quality to that stretch of the story that I actually quite like, and I think could have worked, and actually could have even worked as a Christmas special, if that was the bulk of the episode. I think if this thing had actually started at the setting of the town of Christmas, and was this more ethereal, fairy tale, not standard plot structure kind of story where, you know, residents of this town are, sh are talking about their experiences with the doctor, and we get to see him come in and help somebody, and, you know, maybe in a life-saving way, maybe in a very mundane way, as he sort of, he lives there, but he also kind of flits in and out of their lives, and they flit in and out of his, because he outlives all of them. I think something like that, taking up the legitimate bulk of the episode, I would have been totally on board with. Instead, because it has to share space with everything else that this episode is doing, that entire segment is crammed into a much smaller space where it doesn't have room to breathe like so many of the other things going on. And it has to share space with this other stuff that doesn't share its vibe. I think that's the big thing for me. I like the vibe of that section, but that's not the vibe of what we open with, which is very almost cartoonishly sitcom-y and jokey, and it doesn't match the vibe of, of, you know, dealing with the Daleks, it doesn't match the vibe on the, um, the Papal Mainframe's ship. It, these things don't flow one into the other. The Doctor's actual final moments, you know, when he's shouting at the Daleks, that's grown on me. I remember not loving it, uh, the first time I saw it, that's grown on me a bit. And I do like his closing moments where he has the vision of Amelia. I, I actually uh, like that quite a bit. I think it's it's touching and it's fitting. And it, uh, and it just works. And his delivery on his little speech is very solid. And I also like the, the trivia fact that both he and Karen Gillan um, are bald and wearing wigs, like completely bald, because they had shaved their heads for movies that they were making around the same time. So they're standing there completely bald and head shaved with wigs on. Uh, that's just a fun trivia fact that I enjoy. But again, the tone and vibe of that very end, that feels, again, a bit more in line with the fairy tale vibe from earlier, the vibe that I like, the vibe that I enjoy, and what I wish had been more of the episode. And my so my feelings about this story have evolved. I think I'm a little softer on it than I was when I first watched it. 
And I think my specific reasons for not liking it are a little bit different than what they were. But overall, I still find this to be one of the weaker Christmas specials, one of the, one of the weaker regeneration stories, definitely. Uh, it's just, it doesn't quite pull together. It's just trying to do too much. And I would actually understand it better if this was the end of Moffat's era and he was trying to do a blowout for himself as well as for Matt Smith, but it's not. Moffat stayed on, so I don't know why he's feeling the need to cram in all these additional creatures and all these plot wrap-ups as if he's not going to have time to do more of that stuff later. I just don't get it. But uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there. And I think it's just important to remember one thing. We all change when you think about it. We're all different all through our lives, and that's okay. That's good. You've got to keep moving. As long as you remember all the people that you used to be. I will never forget this day. Not one line. I will always remember when the council was me. The council is not just me. You are the council. I'm just running the meetings. Till next time, this council is adjourned. Thanks so much for watching. I have a Patreon if you want to support what I do. Please like, subscribe, share this around, and be well.